Introduction by Dan Egan Read by Dan Egan October 20th, 2020 In May of 2000, my brother John and I were in northeastern Canada on the frozen coast of Ungava Bay on the Arctic Ocean in Nunavik in a blinding windstorm. I had gotten separated from my group and was seeking shelter from the wind against a big piece of ice. John, Dean Dekas, and cameraman Eric Schammer were with the Inuit guides a hundred yards or so away, and I was shaking from a flashback of being lost in a snowstorm on Mount Elbrus in Russia ten years earlier. Our objective was to traverse east on the Torngat mountain range from the coast of Angava Bay to the Labrador Peninsula. Our main goal was to ski Tower Mountain, a standalone sphinx-like pyramid on the border of Labrador. We were traveling by snowmobile and living with the Inuit, building igloos at night, fishing for Arctic char to complement our meals, ski touring, and climbing the endless mountain chutes along the way. A year earlier, John and I had spoken about a reunion trip back to Mount Elbrus, but decided a new adventure would be a better way to celebrate rather than going back to the site of such a tragic loss. So I organized this trip through a grant provided by a partnership with Canadian and Quebec tourism offices to document and discover whether ski touring would be possible in this frozen land. However, here I was, hunkered down in another wild storm, scared, unable to find my way in the Arctic, remembering Elbrus. It has been difficult for me to speak of the isolation I feel when surrounded in clouds, wind, and snow, in the mountains, or in the fog on the open ocean while sailing. My body tenses up, my breathing gets short, and I start to think of what will happen if I can't find the others or a path forward. As a pro skier, coach, guide, and sailor, I have found myself in these conditions many times over the years since being trapped for over 38 hours lost in the storm that killed a dozen climbers on Mount Elbrus. Even today, 30 years later, the sensation remains very personal. I haven't found a way to express the panic that builds in situations like this. Often, being the one in charge, I mask my fear with confidence and a gentle urgency to move myself and my companions towards safety. Our trip to Angava Bay was our second trip up north. Two years earlier, we traveled to Baffin Island, the largest island in Canada, to ski the fjords along the Davis Strait. We stayed on Broughton Island in a small research hut and traveled by snowmobile across the frozen sea to the coast of Baffin to tour, climb, and ski. I liked the north. It was a world wrapped in snow and ice that brings you back in time. Since the mid-1980s, John and I had built a reputation for skiing the world's remote locations. We traveled throughout the Eastern Bloc at the end of the Cold War, skied with the Kurds in Turkey during Desert Storm, pioneered heli-skiing in Chile, skied the Marshall Glacier above the Drake Passage on the southern tip of Argentina, snuck into Lebanon to ski in the mid-1990s, as well as skiing the classic lines and resorts across Europe and North America. Together, John and I have chalked up more than 50 first descents, launched off cliffs the height of 12-story buildings, and skied more than our share of pristine, perfect powder snow on mountain peaks around the globe. Our mountain antics were documented by filmmakers and writers and shared on VHS tapes, cable television shows, magazines, and books years before the advent of the X Games, Half Pipes, Terrain Parks, GoPro, YouTube, and social media. The brother angle played well. John, six years my elder, was my childhood hero. His bold personality and life-on-the-edge attitude left me searching for a way to gain his attention and confidence. And I found it in the marketing of our brand as the Egan Brothers, through films, television shows, merchandise, and sponsorships, which I managed and produced. Growing up in a large family, my parents, Marlon and Robert, had seven children, embedded a work ethic and goal-setting standard that lives deep within me and all of my siblings. Mary Ellen, Bob, 
John, Sue, Ned, and Mike are all fiercely independent souls with big hearts and a belief system of service to others. I love them all. They have all supported me in the good times and in the hard times. But most of all, they have accepted my rough edges and all that comes along with them. There is nothing like family for creating tension, releasing emotion, and caring. I've never found a replacement for it, and trust me, I have looked. Skiing is timeless and simple, which is why I love it. The satisfaction of joy of gliding on, over, and through snow. This all started for me as a young boy. Every fall, just after Halloween, we trekked into the attic as a family, hauled down all the boots and the clothing, bringing the skis up from the basement, and turning our living room into a ski shop. Boots were tried on, bindings adjusted, and poles handed out. Whatever fit, automatically became yours. Then we began waxing our skis in the basement, placing our gear by the cellar door, and waiting for snow. We lived on a hill, so when snow fell, we skied and rode the yellow snurfers down the hill, over the jumps, then run back to the top for another run. On Saturdays, we loaded up the car, headed towards Howard Johnson's parking lot at the exit to the highway, and boarded the Blizzard Ski Club bus for New Hampshire. I took ski lessons until I was 16. We were taught by the Austrians at the Paul and Paula Villar Ski School at Mount Sunapee and Cannon Mountain, as well as the Egon Zimmerman Ski School at Blue Hills, just a few miles from my family home in Milton, Massachusetts. In the 1970s, Bob and John always had cool gear. I remember when they were on their Olin Ballet skis, plus jet sticks, an extension for the back of boots that would allow you to lean back and do freestyle tricks. My sister Mary Ellen was an expert skier as well and would challenge us younger kids to turning contests. She was the queen of quick turns, feet locked together, smooth and flawless. In high school, when I finally got new skis and boots that fit, my world opened up. The skills I learned from ski school expanded to skiing the woods, moguls, and racing down icy runs. Skiing fostered two main things in me independence and confidence. The independence was forced on me by my two older brothers, refusing to wait for a 10-year-old kid. The confidence grew over time, knowing one day I would catch them. When I was a senior in high school, having been tested by Bob and his friends on the Norwich University Ski Patrol, where he went to school, and at Sugarbush, where John was a ski bum, I finally had my first taste of the wild side of life and what real skiing felt like off the beaten path. My skills were coming up to their standards. I jumped my first real cliff at Mad River Glen Ski Area in Vermont. In the early 1980s, the landings were flat. I was skiing with one of John's ski bum friends, Tim Ritson. It was on a fresh powder day, and he was showing me all the cliff drops in the woods. He was telling me, out west, you can do this and ski away from the cliffs. It was steeper and deeper. Since that day, I've been hooked on the thrill of heading towards the edge of a cliff and flying off of it. I've come to call it the eternal now, when everything slows down and then, bang, you land in a pillow of snow. That day with Tim, I got a taste of that feeling and wanted more. Meeting, skiing, and working with Warren Miller was fuel for my life. His films provided me with a platform, a way to belong to the ski industry I could never have foreseen. He introduced me to the art of filmmaking, storytelling, and how to distribute the end product. The door he opened became a path to many possibilities for my ideas, passion, and drive. He once told me, when I skied, I should think about the beauty of the place and my role in it, which was to complement the surroundings and to be an exclamation point on the mountain. His many examples have been inspiration for this book, my films, articles, and career. Thirty years in a white haze is more than a ski story. Yes, at the center are our snow adventures, but more importantly, this is an attempt to show the historical connections and generational ties through family. We also explore the roots of extreme skiing in the 1980s, how it is forever tied to the freestyle movement, which was started by Stein Erikson in the 1950s, on to the hot doggers of the 1970s, and brings to life the people who shaped extreme skiing in the 1980s and 1990s. 
It was a wild, fun, and impactful time in the ski industry when skiers went from straight skis to shaped skis, dark blue conservative ski wear to day glow one piece suits, and letting long hair fly free of helmets. My co author Eric Wilbur and I decided to tell this story through the third person viewpoint. We believe that telling the story from that perspective allowed more space for the many voices, thoughts, and recollections of people who were interviewed to be heard and understood. This story also expresses how the 1990 Degree 7 expedition to Mount Elbrus affected my life. I've come to believe that trauma doesn't shape your life. Rather, it dictates it. Being lost in a snowstorm with wind blowing over 100 miles per hour, trudging through five-foot-plus deep snow, and digging a snow cave in the battle to survive on one of the precipice seven summits of the world while being separated from my brother, all formed internal reactions I couldn't control for years afterwards. Walking off that mountain alive on May 3, 1990, was the beginning of my adult life as I know it today. I was 26 years old, and for the next 30 years, I've had to learn to restructure the patents caused by that traumatic experience. That trip has touched every aspect of my life. Relationships with my siblings, especially John, the ending of my marriage in 2001, post-divorce relationships, business and financial decisions, especially when I've felt threatened, and where and why I ski the locations I do today. That trip brought me closer to God and helped me to understand the deep and rich roots of faith that run through the generations of my family. It also created my wonderful, rewarding, sober life, which is a constant cycle of discovering who I am. 30 years in a white haze is my story of how skiing almost killed me and saved me, all at the same time. I hope you enjoy it.